Good morning. morning. Welcome to the worship of God the Almighty at the Trinitarian Congregational Parish of Castine. And we welcome not only those of you who are joining us in this sanctuary, but also those of you who are on Zoom or YouTube. We are glad you are with us. Um, This is an exciting and uplifting day for this congregational family. Immediately following the service, there will be a congregational meeting to receive the recommendation and motion of your search committee to call Dr. Andrea Lloyd to be our settled pastor. Now, rather than talk about her in a third person, since she is sitting right here, uh, I should tell you that uh, she will be leading worship this morning. And I should also say that uh, whether or not you know it, this may be your first time to lead worship here, but we have circulated so much information that we really do feel like we know you. So we, we offer you our welcome here this morning. For those of you online, if you choose, members who choose to, who would like to join that congregational meeting, uh, stay on Zoom, do not get off. There'll be a slight delay as we get ourselves organized here in the sanctuary, um, but we will pull you up on a computer here. And so you will see us, I hope, and we will see you. So please stay on. Immediately following that congregational meeting, there will be a time of fellowship and food. Did I mention food? Uh, there will be a time of fellowship and food, and we hope you will uh, join, join us at that time. Remember that this Friday, no neighbor left behind. You all have been so kind and generous that the food that's necessary has already been spoken for. But if you would like to join the raucous crowd that packages and delivers in bags, uh, we ask you to join us at two o'clock in the vestry on Friday. We also want to say that this is the week that we had graduation at the Maine Maritime Academy and we offer those graduates our best wishes. We also note that the training ship State of Maine leaves uh, beginning of this week and so next Sunday we will conclude our worship as ever when it's uh, on the waters with the uh, with the Navy hymn. Are there other announcements that call for our attention before we begin our time of worship? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Celebrate God in this sacred space. Did I skip? (laughs) Celebrate God in all places under heaven. Give praise for God's mighty deeds. Give praise for God's resurrecting power. Praise God with a fanfare of trumpets. Praise God with the harp and the shell. Praise God with tambourines. Wait, I'm really. Praise God with a fanfare of trumpets. Praise God with the harp and the cello. We'll skip the dancing, okay? <laughs> Praise God with flutes and guitars. Let everything with life and breath praise God. The opening hymn this morning, Come to the Faithful, Raise the Strain, in the Black Hymnals, number 230.
Please join me in the prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Living God, as the risen Christ came into the locked room of the first disciples, may your word enter into us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that me who have not seen my yet believe. Amen. Well, good morning. It is such a joy to be with you all this morning. Thank you for ordering up this beautiful, sunshiny day. So this is our time with all of God's children, which means all of you. And this is the congregational participation portion of the morning, which you were not warned about. <laughs> but here we are. So later in the service, we are going to be considering some important words in our lives as church, words like faith and belief and doubt, words whose meanings are important to what we do here in church, and they are words whose meanings can carry baggage. We have feelings about those words, some of us. We have judgments associated with them sometimes. So we're going to do a little warm up exercise here. We're gonna do a little word play, and I'm gonna need your help with this. Our goal is simply to loosen up our understanding of some of those words just enough that we can put down any baggage we may have associated with them. Just enough to create a little bit of an opening for the Holy Spirit to maybe do something new in us and with us when we get to hearing the word later in this service. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little word play. I'm gonna say a word and you're gonna tell me it's opposite, okay? All right, you can all do this. And we're gonna do a little warm up before we get to the hard words. So for example, if I were to say cold and you can just shout this out and there are no wrong answers in this space for the moment. If I were to say cold, what would you say? Very good. All right, you've got the hang of it. It's going to get harder, though. It's going to get harder. If I were to say near, far, okay. Here's a, here's a challenge word. What if I were to say salty? Sweet. Ooh, I heard, okay, salty and sweet. Does anybody think of any, anything else? We're near the ocean, so salty could also be landlubber. So we can, right, we can have more than one word. Or salty water, what would the opposite be? Fresh. Okay, I'm not going to go down to a lesson on hydrology, but you get the idea. Okay, so now we're going to play for real. This is this is the this is the advanced round here. <laughs> you did so well with part one. Okay, so if I were to say the word faith, what would you say is the opposite of faith? Yeah. Doubt. Doubt. All right. Any other any other words? Fear. Fear. Nice. What else? Disbelief. Disbelief. Oh, faithless. That's good. That is a pro move there. You can add un or less and you get the opposite. Okay, so we have a lot of different ideas about faith. One of the other, one of the ways of thinking about the word faith is to think of it as trust. So in Hebrews, for example, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So if we thought about faith as trust, what might the opposite be? Mistrust. Okay, right. So the opposite of faith might be a lack of trust in God, for example. So we can create some wiggle room around these words. We can start to find some complexity of meaning. So let's go to another one. How about belief? What would the opposite of belief be? Doubt. Doubt. Okay. Another, anything else? Any other? Disbelief. Right. Unbelief. Okay. Finally, let's, let's go to doubt. We've heard doubt is the opposite, but what would the opposite of doubt be? Knowing. Ooh, all right. Trust. Yeah, okay. So oftentimes we think about some of these words as being in opposition with each other, that faith is the opposite of doubt. But as we're gonna talk about a little bit later on, um, there are those um, who believe that in fact, faith and doubt are not opposites, that belief is an intellectual proposition, that when we believe in God, we say true, and that faith is our yes to God, and that those two things don't necessarily have to act in opposition. So what I hear us doing in this little exercise, and maybe you hear it too, is breaking down the sense that some of these words, faith, belief, doubt, exist in opposition to one another, and instead seeing them as maybe a little bit of a messier constellation. 
And if what's in your head feels a slight bit messier than what was in your head before, then we're in a good place. We're going to try to hold on to some of that messiness as we go into scripture. Um, but I want to ask you one more question before we do that. This is, this is the fun fact of the morning. Um, I'll start with the easy fun fact. Who can tell me what the Apostle Thomas, who we're going to hear from later today, is often called, at least in the United States? Yeah, exactly. Doubting Thomas. Okay, and is that a good thing or a bad thing to call someone? Do you want to be called a Doubting Thomas? No. Okay, that's one of those places where doubt has some baggage associated with it, right? That we're going to try to pull apart a little bit. But here's the, um, here's the second fun fact. Does anyone know what they call Thomas in the Eastern, in many Eastern churches? So, for example, if you were to go to Christian churches in India, does anybody know what Thomas is called there? St. Thomas, the twin, he's often called the twin, that is true. But in Indian churches, he's called Thomas the Believer. So his full name, if we put it together, is Doubting Thomas the Believer. So both of those things exist in the life of that one faithful man, and that's where we're gonna go in a little bit. But first, will you please pray with me? Gracious God, we pray that you would make yourself known to us in all of the seasons of our lives of faith. Remind us, God, that you believe in us even when our belief in you falters. Strengthen us, God, in our faith that we would see you more clearly and love you more dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We come now, friends, to our prayer of confession. And to confess literally means to declare openly without reservation. And so we do in this time of confession. We look clearly at our own lives. We declare openly before God the ways in which we have fallen short or missed the mark. And we ask for the forgiveness we need. And so trusting in God's steadfast love and boundless mercy, we offer this prayer of confession. We will pray first aloud in unison, the words printed in your bulletin, and then individually in a short time of silence. Let us pray. God of the empty tomb, we long to believe, but we confess that some days the voices of fear and doubt are all that we can hear. When we are afraid to speak our faith in the world, forgive us and help us to find our voice. When we are afraid to forgive and to love again, forgive us and give us the power to forgive. When we are confined by our hurts, touch us with your wounded hands and set us free. When we are bewildered by our doubts, draw near to us and give us peace. Amen. This season of Easter attests to the unshakable power of God's love. As the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are loved by God. And by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now please rise as you are able.
Our scripture lessons this week explore the theme of witness. They remind us that the work of discipleship is not only interior. As followers of Christ, we are called, we are sent to bear witness, to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. Bearing witness is a practice that is rooted as deep as it can be in the Christian faith. Jesus himself bore witness to who he was, even unto death. And the disciples followed suit as described in this reading from the book of Acts. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you were determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, so that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Our second reading is from Psalm 118. The Psalms, as you know, are expressions of human response to God. And in their totality, they cover just about every mood that that response can take, anger, lament, praise, and thanksgiving. This Psalm, as fitting the Easter season, is a Psalm that celebrates God's goodness and that answers that goodness with the psalmist's expressions of gratitude for all that God has done. We will read this Psalm responsive, responsively. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad and save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We don't hear that much in the lectionary from the Revelation to John. Revelation is in the genre of apocalypse, not in the sci-fi movie sense of the word, but in its true meaning, an uncovering, a revealing. What this book reveals is a revelation of Jesus Christ given to John, we don't know which John this was precisely, to show his servants what must soon take place. The passage that you'll hear is from the very beginning of the book, and it functions primarily to describe Jesus and in describing him to point us to God. In keeping with the theme this week of witness, listen for the description of Jesus as witness. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. believe that in last week's gospel reading you heard about the empty tomb and about Mary Magdalene's encounter with Jesus in the garden. That encounter leads Mary to return to the disciples and make an announcement that has been described as the first Easter sermon. I have seen the Lord. This passage picks up immediately after that one and I'll just let you listen and hear what you hear. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you might have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now please rise as you are able and join in our next hymn, um, number 256 in the Black Hymnal.
please be seated. Will you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I used to be afraid of church. I admitted this one day to a dear friend. I think I believe in God, I had told him, and I don't know what to do about that. He had offered a helpful suggestion in response. You could go to church, he said. And I considered it for about 15 seconds before informing him that no, no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go to church, I told him, until I figured out what I believed, until I dispensed with all of my doubts. He was very patient with me. Uh-huh, he replied, that's one option. Or, just a thought, you could go to church to help you figure out what you believe. I found this unconvincing. I was an academic, a professor. I had spent my life in a world that valued expertise, where being good meant having the right answers. And I assumed the church worked the same way, that people who were good at church had the right answers about church, that they had certainty. And me, all I had was this yearning towards belief and a whole lot of doubt. And I was pretty confident, therefore, that I would not pass the entrance exam that I was sure waited for me inside of church. So I stayed away for a little while longer. But as you may have figured out by this point in the sermon, I did eventually muster the courage to enter a church. And I quickly learned that I was wrong about a lot of what I thought I knew about church. For one, there was no entrance exam. For another, while there were answers, beautiful, life-changing answers, mostly what I found in church were people yearning as I yearned to draw nearer to God, people asking questions, people open to being changed by the answers they found. People, in other words, not at all unlike the disciples that we heard about in today's gospel lesson. People not at all unlike Thomas. Today's gospel passage picks up where last week's left off. Mary, remember, had come from the tomb and announced to the disciples that she had seen the Lord. We don't know exactly how the disciples responded, but today's passage hints that they did not believe her, at least not fully. John reports that it is not until Jesus has shown them his wounds that they too see the Lord. They needed to see to believe. And every single gospel has some version of this story. They're very different in the specifics, but in every last one of the Gospels, the disciples have an experience of, or hear testimony from someone who has had an experience of the resurrected Christ. And in every single version of that story, there is some struggle with that truth. There is fear or doubt or unbelief. There's a running away, a pushing away, a turning away. The Gospels speak in one voice, Christ is risen, and belief, it seems, doesn't always come easy, even to those who were there. And for John's gospel, that fact is not incidental. John's gospel takes that refrain and amplifies it by inviting us into Thomas's struggle to believe. As you heard it read, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus visited the other disciples. Thomas, undoubtedly still in a haze of grief after seeing his teacher and friend and hoped for Messiah executed, comes home from wherever it is he was and hears all of his friends shouting and rejoicing, saying, we have seen the Lord. It's a lot to take in. I mean, 
Jesus died, that much was very, very clear to Thomas. And Thomas surely knew that the dead stay dead. And yet there are his friends, his most trusted companions, making a truly incredible claim. Jesus lives. We have seen the Lord. Imagine it. How would any of us react? Well, Thomas reacts by wanting proof. I need to see, to touch, to feel for myself, he says. And as you heard, a week later, he gets the chance. But before we go to that part of the story, I think there's something for us to see even before that happens. In that in-between week, after Thomas's declaration of unbelief and before Jesus comes again. Here again, verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And then verse 26, a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. In this week after Easter, I found myself pausing in the space between those two verses. Thomas declared his unbelief. A week later, Jesus appeared. In other words, for a full week, all Thomas had in answer to his doubts and his unbelief was the testimony of those who were there and saw the risen Christ. That week, that's the space where we live out our lives of faith. Like Thomas, we have not physically seen, nor have we physically touched the risen Christ. Like Thomas, we rely on the testimony of those who did. Like Thomas, we must try to believe that which we cannot see or touch or prove. Thomas's story has something important to say about how to live with faith in in-between times. Because here's the thing, while John doesn't tell us what did happen during that week between Thomas's declaration of unbelief and Jesus's return, he does tell us what didn't happen. And two very important things didn't happen in that space. First of all, Thomas didn't leave. He didn't storm out to find a new community of people who shared his incredulity about the dead being alive. And he didn't slip off into the night, ashamed that he couldn't believe like the others could. Both of those options would have been very understandable. But Thomas stayed. Despite his unbelief, he stayed. And that is a crucial detail in this story. Martin Copenhaver, who's a UCC minister and the author of a book, a pretty old book now, called Living Faith While Holding Doubts, argues that belief is not a prerequisite for faith, which sounds a little bit like a wild claim, I know. But he says, belief is what we think is true. Faith is how we act. Belief is us saying true. Faith is us saying yes. And therefore, we don't have to have certainty, an unshakable belief in God or in the resurrected Christ to act and live faithfully, not because belief doesn't matter, it surely does, but because it doesn't always come easily. And faith abides even in those times when belief is hard, faith can get us through. That's the story of Thomas in the space in between those two verses, in the space between unbelief and belief. Thomas stays with his people. He stays with the followers of Jesus. Despite his unbelief, he stays. Sometimes that's what faith looks like. Thomas didn't leave. That's the first thing that didn't happen that week. Here's another thing that didn't happen. The other disciples didn't drive him out. They didn't brand him a heretic for his unbelief. They didn't tell him to go find somewhere else to live. They didn't leave him alone with his doubts. He stayed with them and they stayed with him too. 
And if that isn't church, I don't know what is. And this simple fact speaks an important truth. The contours of our lives of faith encompass times of doubt, times when belief is hard to grasp. And Thomas's faithfulness, the faithfulness of staying, the faithfulness of simply being with our doubts, of not turning away, of not lapsing into the false comfort of tidy certainties, it leads him somewhere beautiful. It leads him to Christ. Thomas stayed and Christ returned and he met Thomas right there in the thick of his doubts and his unbelief. He met him there with understanding, with acceptance. He met him there with help. Put your finger here, reach out your hand and put it in my side, Jesus said. And he met him there with encouragement. Do not doubt, but believe. Belief isn't always easy, and Jesus seems to know that. And to be willing to meet us on the hard and holy ground of the times in our lives where faith is hard, where belief eludes us, where doubt grows loud. Those times where we strive and yearn with limited success to believe that which we cannot see. Jesus meets us in that place and in meeting us there helps us to make of doubt a doorway into deeper belief. And it matters, I think, that Thomas held his doubt like a question, not an answer. That question led him into shimmery depths of belief that he could not have imagined. That question led him to see Christ not just as the living Jesus, their Lord, resurrected, but God. My Lord and my God, he says. In that moment, Thomas sees Christ more clearly, more fully than any other disciple. We have seen the Lord, the others said. My Lord and my God, Thomas adds. Doubt need not be the enemy of belief. It is surely not the enemy of faith. And that is good news for us this Easter season, because this text, it is not content to remain quietly in the past. It makes a claim on us, the people who will have to believe what they cannot see. But these are written so that you, so that we, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. We are called, over and over again, we are called into the same journey that Thomas took in that week of doubt-filled waiting. Called to travel through the seasons of doubt that visit almost every life of faith. Called to believe that which we cannot see or touch or prove. Called to be changed by our belief. Most sermons have a go and do moment, usually towards the end, right about here, and most of mine will. Jesus, after all, was big on going and doing. But this text on this day, I hear it pointing us somewhere a bit different. I hear it saying that the go and do is sometimes to stay and be. And honestly, sometimes that is the harder road. We are called to wrestle as Thomas wrestled with the mystery, the beautiful life-changing mystery of this Easter season so that we might believe as he believed, see Christ as he saw Christ, not with our eyes maybe, but as the poet R.S. Thomas puts it, with the whole of our being overflowing with him as a chalice would with the sea. Thomas didn't believe, but Thomas stayed. Doubt is a dimension of the life of faith. Believing is hard sometimes. This text assures us of that truth and of this one. If we are willing to stay and be with ourselves and with each other through those seasons of doubt that will come, trusting that the risen Christ meets us right there, meets us with a blessing, then our doubts, too, can become doorways into deeper belief. And then we, too, Easter people that we are, shall proclaim with awe, with joy, 
our Lord and our God. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, we've come to the time in the service for us to offer our gifts. In the gospel reading, you hear the disciples bearing witness to the living Christ, speaking the truth of what they have experienced. Their witness takes the form in this gospel lesson of testifying, of speaking those beautiful words. We have seen the Lord, my Lord, and my God. We can testify to that truth with our words, to be sure, and we can testify with our lives by continuing Jesus's ministry in a hurting world. This time of offering is one way that we can live out our witness by sharing of what we have in order to spread love and bring hope to those in need. I invite you to give generously as you are able. This morning's offering will be received. We've come to that time in our service where we are invited to share whatever it is we carry on our hearts today. Our joys, our sorrow, sorrows, our concerns, our celebrations. There are names to be remembered in the bulletin. Are there other joys and concerns on your heart today? And let us pray. Creator God, author of all that is, God of our dormant season, God of our springtimes, 
God of green growing things, God of the sparrow and God of the whale, God of all creation, God of the still unfolding new creation. God, we come to you today with grateful hearts. We thank you, God, for Jesus, for Christ who rose, Christ who lives, for God with us, that steady stream of grace and peace that changes our lives. We thank you, God, for resurrection joy. We thank you for the rugged spark of your abiding hope, antidote to despair, kindled in the most unlikely places. And God, we thank you this day for church, for the preciousness of human community, the sustenance of neighborly love, the gladness of hearts turned together to you. We thank you, God, for the way that you call us out of ourselves into new ways of being. And we thank you for the fellowship that helps us live into those calls. And on this Sunday after Earth Day, God, we thank you for the gift of your creation, for the praise songs of birds, the unfurling green of new life, the sound of running water, even, God, the squelchiness of mud after a long, frozen winter. Tune our eyes, God, that we might see you reflected in the beauty and bounty of your creation, that we might walk on this earth lightly with reverence. This is the day that you have made, O oh God, and we do rejoice in it. But even in the midst of our rejoicing, God, we know that there are many here in our midst and throughout the world whose lives are heavy laden with grief, with illness, with trial, with loneliness. We pray healing, God, for all who are not well in body, mind, or spirit. We pray solace for all who grieve. We pray abundance for all whose lives bear the heavy weight of poverty, of food insecurity, of homelessness, and of want. Where there is injustice, God, we pray justice. Where there is suffering, we pray comfort. God, we lift up in our prayers today the people of Ukraine. Comfort the grieving, the wounded, the displaced, the frightened. And we pray to God for all whose lives are affected by conflict and by war. We pray, God, we pray for peace, peace in our hearts, peace between neighbors, peace in this world. Hear our prayers, O oh God, those spoken aloud and those held in the silence of our hearts. We pray all of this in the name of the one who is and was and is to come, your son, Jesus Christ, and now with Christians of every time and every place, we are bold to pray the prayer he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please rise in body or spirit for the singing of our closing hymn, Lift Up Your Hearts, Ye People, which is number 189 in the Pilgrim Hymnal.
come down to us not contain the God who lives to disturb and heal us. Bless you with the power to go forth and proclaim the gospel. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and stay with you always. Amen. 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 And now please be seated for the first time. Amen.